So last week I made a good start uh, talking about the cost of emission reduction, um, which means that we can finish this uh, in less than an hour, and then we have plenty of time to start talking about policy instruments for emission reduction. So last term, I, last year, I had eight hours to talk about policy instruments come in, and this term I have to do it in three hours, right? Yeah, so it's got to be a bit of a challenge. But uh, let's first finish the discussion on the cost of emission reduction. I talked about uh, just estimates, what is the order of magnitude of these things and why there's disagreement. Uh, I also talked about the feasibility of deep uh, emission uh, cuts. Uh, <clears throat> When I talked about the total and marginal cost of emission reduction, I just talked about these things on average. Um, but there's also interesting things to say about the distribution of costs. And of course, politically, it matters much more how costs are distributed over the population than what is the average. Um, <clears throat> now, economists uh, refer to discussions of the distribution of costs often as uh, by the word of incidence. I really don't know where this word comes from or what it means, uh, but when an economist uses the word incidence, he or she means um, who pays, right? That is uh, just a bit of uh, jargon. Um, and you may think uh, that this is relatively straightforward. Uh, when we talked about where do these emissions come from, they come from energy use, they come from agriculture, and both are necessary goods. So you would think that, yeah, it's the poor who would pay disproportional uh, for uh, climate policy. Um, and what you're looking at here are the so-called angle uh, spending curves, which essentially tells you uh, how much people are paying as a share of their income uh, towards um, electricity, other forms of energy, electricity and gas, and other forms of energy, right? Uh, I did not make this, um, make this graph. And you see that that is indeed uh, the case. This is for the United Kingdom. This is a panel data set from, I believe, 20... Uh, no, from 1980 to, I think, around 2015. Um, and what you see is indeed, <clears throat> we have uh, income on the um, horizontal axis. We have uh, spending as a fraction of total spending or as a fraction of total income, uh, rather. Um, no, this is just total spending, not as a fraction. Um, <clears throat> um, and you see very clearly that this is not a 45 degree line, right? So richer people, yes, spend more on energy in an absolute sense, but relative to their income, they spend less. So if through a policy you increase the price of energy, it's going to hit the poorer people disproportionately harder, right? Um, so if we uh, then run uh, a model and say, well, we're going to impose a carbon tax or something, um, <clears throat> then or some other policy, and we actually switch from the U.S. Uh, from the U.K. to the U.S. and uh, from the past uh, to some future. Uh, you see indeed uh, the same story, that the highest uh, decile, the richest 10% uh, of people would face an absolute cost of around $1,800 uh, per person, per, per household per year, uh, whereas the poorest households uh, would face uh, some $750. This, of course, is less in an absolute sense, but then if you compare this to their income, then the richest would pay about 0.8% of their income towards climate policy, and the poorest uh, would pay 2.2% uh, of their income. Of course, this is an illustration, right? Uh, last week we talked about how the costs of climate policy are so very uncertain, and of course depends on the exact nature of that climate policy. 
But uh, as an illustration, this uh, shows um, the orders uh, of magnitude and the, uh, what some would say, uh, an unfair distribution uh, of the costs. Um, <coughs> now, for a long time, this was accepted as generally true uh, until um, 15 years ago. Uh, this guy, uh, Ferdinand Rouse at uh, MIT, wrote his PhD at MIT, uh, said, well, perhaps this is not quite true. There are other things going on uh, as well. Uh, so this was accepted as canon for a couple of decades until uh, Rouse came along and then first people laughed at him uh, and then people redid his sums and stopped laughing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is for these tiles. Let's first look at the same picture. Uh, swing tiles, again, we're moving a little bit further in time. It's still the United States. Um, uh, and they call it quintiles, but they, um, yeah, they're quintiles uh, more generally. No, oh, they're okay. Americans, Latin, not a good idea. These are uh, yeah, they are. They are quintiles. Sorry, um, <laughs> it's my. The, the, I uh, got some underlying cold, so I feel absolutely uh, terrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, the poorest 20%, uh, the richest 20%, uh, expenditure on electricity, gas, uh, uh, gasoline, um, and natural gas for home heating. Uh, you see the same pattern again, right? The poorest spend relatively most uh, towards uh, their income. Uh, so this is just the same uh, story that I just told you, uh, but a different study, and therefore I need to update um, your uh, numbers. Um, but there's another thing going on, and that is if you look for the five quintiles, where do people get their money, you see a, uh, another uh, story uh, emerging. So in black, very dark blue, we're looking at wages. In red, we're looking at income transfers. So benefits uh, and stuff, and what you see is that they are proportionally much more important for the poor uh, and for the rich. Um, but uh, the crucial part of the story uh, that I'm going to tell next is the light blue part, which is the income derived from capital. <clears throat> so this is ownership of equity, uh, essentially, uh, as well as uh, ownership of um, houses, right? And this matters. <clears throat> so uh, the pattern that I show here is purely on the expenditure side. And because the poor spend more of their income towards energy and agriculture, energy and food, they are hurt more by a climate policy. That is true on the expenditure side. Uh, but what Rouse and others have said, well, we should also look at the other side uh, of the equation. We also should look at income. Um, and what happens if um, you increase the price of energy, well, then you would redistribute things on the input side uh, as well. And in a way that is actually disadvantageous to the rich. Now, why is that? If you think of electricity, how do you use electricity? Well, you use electricity to feed your laptop and your mobile phone. And your laptop actually makes you more productive. But without a laptop, you would not have any use for the electricity. It's fairly pointless, electricity. You can't eat it, you can't drink it, you can't do anything with it. You can only get appliances to run. Uh, same is true for companies. They don't use energy per se, but they use energy to run their machinery. And without the machinery, they can feed the energy into their workers, but that does not do any good, right? So 
thinking about production functions, energy is a close complement to capital, but not so much to labor. It's the composite of energy and capital that you then combine with labor and makes people more productive and therefore uh, command a higher wage. But it's not that energy directly feeds into labor, right? Uh, and the implication of this is that if you make energy more expensive, then its close complement, capital, becomes less productive. And capital income falls. Now, if capital becomes less productive, then labor also becomes less productive. Uh, but capital, because it's a close complement, takes a harder hit than labor does. So if you argue like this, you would say, well, if you increase the price of energy, then capital takes a harder hit than labor. So now we have an ambiguous effect, right? On the expenditure side, yes, the poor are hit, hit hardest. That is still true. But on the income side, the rich are hit harder. Um, and then if you stick it into uh, calibrated um, uh, calibrated models, uh, you find something like this. Uh, this is the uh, effect in absolute terms in dark blue or black. Uh, I think it's dark blue. Um, you look at the effects on the expenditure side, um, where indeed you see that the uh, poor are hit disproportionately hard. Uh, but if you look at the light blue, that is the income side, you see that the rich are hit much harder. And the poor may actually benefit as because energy is more expensive, it makes less sense to automate. And there's actually jobs created at the bottom end of the labor market. Go ahead. Why do the rich like, spend significantly more than the, the poorer people? I did not hear you because why, of that. Why do the rich spend like, significantly, significantly more than the, the poorer people? Uh, what, what because they simply have more money, right? And uh, it's a factor three here, 265 versus uh, 674. So. The absolute hit for the rich is three times as large, but their income is about 20 times as large. Why do rich people spend more on energy? Because they have bigger houses, bigger cars, they travel more. Yeah, but if you're in London, you probably have a flat or something. Is it, how, how do you know that's a, that's a guarantee? I can't, I can't hear you because of the noise. How do you know that's a, is that like a guarantee that the more, the more you uh, earn, the more you spend? No, there's no guarantee. Uh, this is a statistical regularity. There are indeed a few very rich people who spend very little money and save everything. Uh, but that is an exception. In general, what you would see is that richer people spend more money. Right? I'm uh, not, not sure why you're questioning this. No, I'm questioning you why is it so much more than everyone else? Why is what so much more? You can be like a normal person, use a normal house, like everyone else, but still have a like high income. But yeah, but ri ri richer people live in different houses than poorer people. Right? Yeah. I don't know where you live, but I'm pretty sure you, that you don't live in the same house, a similar house as I do. I'm sure that you don't live in the same house. Um, right? Mm -hmm. You probably share an apartment. Mm. Yeah. I have a uh, detached house in somewhere in the countryside. Right? Yeah. Richer people live in different places, in different houses than poorer people. And therefore, a bigger house takes more energy to eat. Yeah. Right? Mm. Okay. In, ter in terms of spending money on cooking and stuff, it's probably roughly the same, right? Because I don't cook my food longer than you do.
but in terms of everything else, um, richer people simply spend more money on everything, right? In general, there's always exceptions, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, there's another uh, part of this story. The assumption here is that climate policy is implemented through a carbon tax. And then the question is, what do you do with a carbon tax? And uh, what they assume here is that money is given back to uh, households. Um, and they also assume that uh, that is slightly progressive. Um, <clears throat> and if you then add that to the story, then it becomes even a more progressive uh, policy reform, right? Of course, this is a political choice. Uh, I used to uh, work in Ireland where we uh, helped the government design uh, the carbon tax and we got the uh, Tornester, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, a Labour uh, politician, uh, to promise that indeed the carbon tax revenue would be used to increase benefits and have the increase particularly uh, benefit the poorest. Um, that was the package that was approved by the Doyle, the Parliament uh, of Ireland. And then one year later, uh, she withdrew uh, that promise, right? Uh, so this is very politically contingent. You get the carbon tax revenue, you get, the carbon tax, you get the carbon tax through the social and uh, political discussion, you get it approved, and then of course politicians need to keep their word, which they don't always do. Uh, but in this case, the assumption is that politicians will keep their word and redistribute the carbon tax revenue so that it disproportionately benefits the poor, and then you get that climate policy is progressive, that the incidence of climate policy falls disproportionately on the rates, right? Um, so, uh, so much for incidents, who pays, right? Two takeaway uh, lessons here. One, don't just look at the expenditure side, but also look at the income side. And second, everything is of course contingent on how the climate policy is designed, right? And there's a lot of political leeway to design it in a um, in a way that we might agree with, but there's also a lot of political leeway to design it in a way that we might disagree uh, with it, right? <clears throat> so, final chapter on the costs. Um, and that is negative costs. And this is going to get a little bit uh, technical. So last week I said, well, if you're going to cut emissions, you impose an additional constraint on your system, you're, you now have to pay for things that used to be free, and therefore emission reduction is going to cost money. We don't know quite how much, uh, but we're pretty sure that it's going to cost money. Um, now, there have been persistent uh, claims, persistent for decades now, uh, that we could reduce emissions and save money at the same time. And uh, you heard uh, President Biden uh, say these things both on the campaign trail uh, and while in office. Uh, you've heard um, Timmermans, the guy who is in charge of all this at the European Union, uh, claim this. And you've heard Boris Johnson claim this as well, that we're going to cut emissions and uh, become fabulously rich at the same time. Uh, this is a popular thing for politicians to say, right? We're going to do good for the environment and we're going to get richer. Now, how could you possibly object uh, to my proposals, right? Now, most of these claims are bogus. They're just not true. Um, and if you look at what is going on, particularly in, in the engineering literature, uh, there's three uh, basic mistakes uh, that engineers make. Um, the first is that they believe that, and politicians uh, like to jump on this, that anything that happens in the market is because of them. 
And uh, last week I showed you an updated version of this picture where we saw that energy efficiency has been improving for the last 60 years. And it's here energy intensity uh, has been falling for the last 60 years. And then I argued, well, actually, if you push this back to Babylonian times, it has been falling for as long as we know. Um, and this is because energy costs money, and therefore technological progress sort of tries to uh, reduce these costs. Um, <coughs> now, a lot of engineers seem to believe that this doesn't happen, that this happens because of engineers getting things better, which is a, a fair belief, because that is actually what is mostly going on. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of politicians who also think, well, this <laughs> happened because of what we did as politicians, right, and policymakers. And that is uh, absolutely not the case. These are just market forces pushing uh, energy intensity uh, down. And if you believe that this is not the case, if you believe that any technological progress is because of uh, political intervention, and yeah, you can claim uh, a lot of good, right? Uh, Al Gore famously claimed that he invented the internet and without uh, his work uh, there would not have been an internet, right? Um, and he really, really said that. Uh, in the climate contest text, um, Bush the Younger, the second president Bush, at one point promised as his main part of uh, U.S. climate policy, that energy efficiency would improve by 14% in the next uh, decade. And that was his main climate policy plans. And he completely forgot that in the previous three decades, uh, energy efficiency had improved by 18%. So he was actually promising something that would happen anyway, right? And he claimed that this was his main achievement, right? Uh, so there's just a lot of confusion here, right? Um, so that is uh, one thing. If you look uh, inside the, um, the engineering models, uh, there's also a lot of hidden costs uh, that are uh, omitted. Um, so, Uh, let's take um, an electric vehicle, right? Uh, you can buy these things now, they're on the market. Um, electric vehicles are very different than internal combustion engines. If you have an internal, if you have a petrol uh, car or a diesel car and it breaks down, you can take it to any repair shop, right? Because all car mechanics know how to fix a diesel engine or a petrol engine. If your electric vehicle breaks down, you need to take this car to a specialist mechanic. So that is just more expensive because they're further away, they charge more money. If you forget in your model that it's not just the cost of buying the vehicle and running the vehicle, but also the costs of repairing the vehicle. And of course, if the repair, if the mechanic is further away, then it's also gonna take longer that you are without uh, your main mode of transport. If you add those costs as well, then the cost benefit analysis is different, right? Then an electric vehicle becomes less attractive than it otherwise would seem. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, these uh, things going on. And in engineering models, typically these things are assumed away or they are assumed to be zero. Whereas in reality, there is a real premium on buying new and new machinery, new uh, appliances that are not tried and tested yet and don't have the whole uh, ecosystem to support uh, their application. <clears throat> um, so that is uh, one thing um, that engineers tend to get wrong. And another thing that engineers tend to get wrong, and I really for the life of me don't know why, 
they assume that households can borrow money at the same rate as the government does. And apparently engineers never go to the bank and ask for a mortgage uh, because this is just not true, right? <laughs> Households pay significantly more in interest than the government does. And a lot of the uh, things that are going on, energy efficiency improvements, but also fuel switching, is an upfront cost, an investment that you then win back uh, later, right? So if you insulate uh, your house, you invest in loft insulation and wall insulation and double glazing and so on and so forth that is a considerable cost and then later on you earn back part of that money by lower energy bills or if you want to put um, solar panels on your house on, on your roof you pay a considerable amount of money and then you earn that back by lower electricity bills so it's an investment, and whether or not this is a profitable investment depends on how hard you discount the future, right? Uh, and if you assume that households have a low discount rate, all these things look profitable and interesting, uh, but if you assume a high discount rate, uh, that is less the case. Um, so a lot of these claims about negative costs are uh, bogus. Uh, but there is also a group of economists who say, well, perhaps there is some truth uh, to this. Um, and that comes from uh, the second uh, best. Now, the model results that I showed yesterday are all results from either uh, optimization or equilibrium models. And Let's assume that they're all optimization models and you know from your micro that optimization and equilibrium uh, are uh, two sides uh, of the same coin. Um, if we assume uh, perfect markets, then the Pareto equilibrium is, or the uh, market equilibrium is of course a Pareto optimum, right? Um, now, if you are in the optimum and you make a policy intervention, you change things, then welfare can go one way only. It can only go down, right? Because you're in the optimum, you have achieved the highest possible welfare, then something changes, welfare can only go down. You should see this as you're standing at the top of a mountain and you want to uh, uh, walk a little, you can only go down because you're at the top already, right? Um, so if your starting point is an equilibrium or an optimum, then the only way the only effect that policy can have is reduce welfare. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, your starting point is an imperfect market and you're not in an optimum, you're not at the top of the hill, then depending on whether you go east or west or north or south, you can go up and you can go down, right? It's not. You cannot a priori say uh, what would happen, right? <clears throat> Um, and the example that people have worked on is what if we could use climate policy to move an imperfect economy closer to a perfect economy? Um, and uh, the typical way uh, of doing this is by using, uh, by applying a carbon tax and then using the carbon tax in a smart way. Right? That is um, what people have done. Now for this, I need to talk a little bit uh, about public economics, realizing that few, more likely none of you, uh, have done public economics. Um, so uh, public economists uh, talk about uh, the distortionarity of taxes. Uh, that is essentially how much does a tax hurt aggregate welfare, right? Uh, and the proper term is distortionarity. Um, <clears throat> now, a tax is more distortionary if the tax base is narrower, 
Essentially, the way to think about this is what would this economy be without taxation? Let's assume that there's no public goods that we need to provide. Uh, let's assume that there's no externalities. Uh, what would the economy be without uh, taxation? And then the government comes along and it imposes taxes. And as a result, relative pr prices change and people make different choices than they otherwise would have made. And the distance between sort of the ideal, the perfect economy without taxes, and then the distorted economy with taxes, that is your measure of uh, distortionarity, right? Now, if the tax base is narrower, then you raise the same million pounds from fewer people, right? This is just the definition of a tax base. The tax base is the number of uh, people and companies who pay the tax, right? So if the tax base is narrower, then you get your million pounds or your billion pounds from fewer people. That necessarily means that you need to have a higher tax, right? If in definitely in absolute terms, that if you impose the tax on fewer people, but you want to keep the same revenue, then you need to collect more money from these people and companies. So the tax base is narrower, the tax is higher, and the higher the tax, and let's assume that it's a tax on income or prices, if your price elasticities, your income elasticities are non-zero, then that means you distort their behavior more, right? Relative prices change more, and therefore your behavior is more different from what it would have been without taxes, right? Um, so taxes are more uh, distortionary if uh, the tax base is narrower. And by the same token, if your price elasticities are higher, then you distort people's behavior more because you change relative prices. Um, so these are just general rules. They are always true. Um, and then the cost of the tax, the distortionarity, is also called the dead weight loss. That is essentially the loss uh, of aggregate welfare. Um, and this is a rule of thumb, is roughly quadratic uh, in the level of the tax. And this is a rule of thumb rather than uh, uh, something that is necessarily true, right? So now let's compare a carbon tax to a income tax. Carbon tax is a tax on energy. Everybody uses energy. So a carbon tax has a broad base, right? It essentially includes everybody in the economy. A labor tax is narrower because I actually don't know the number for the UK. Uh, I'd say around half of the population pays uh, a labor tax, an income tax. Because there's a whole bunch of young people who don't pay uh, income taxes, there's a whole bunch of pensioners who don't pay income taxes, uh, and then there's exceptions for those who don't make a lot of money also don't pay income tax. So it may actually be a bit less than 4 or 50% of people who pay uh, an income tax. So the tax base of a labor tax is narrower than the tax base of a carbon tax. Right? One. Um, price elasticities are actually pretty low in both cases. Definitely in the short run, if energy becomes more expensive, you, you have no choice but to pay it, right? And that is exactly uh, the crisis uh, that we are in uh, at the moment. Uh, but the same is true for uh, income taxes. People don't change their labor supply that much if the income tax goes up. So in both cases, the price elasticity is actually pretty low. Um, third point here, the current carbon tax is very low, right? So if you increase it, you increase the dead weight loss, but you actually come from a pretty low base, so that is fine. Income taxes are pretty high, so if you reduce the income tax, you actually gain a lot of money, right? Because this is a nonlinear uh, relationship. 
So if you take these three factors into account, then shifting the burden of taxation from labor to energy use to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you would actually reduce the overall distortion of the uh, uh, of the fiscal uh, system, right? And you would actually gain something. And that would at least partially offset the costs of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, now, people have called this uh, the double dividend, uh, but in fact, there's three. Um, so uh, the first dividend is that the carbon tax reduces greenhouse gas emissions, right? Which is why we do this in the first place. Uh, the second dividend is that we can use um, the carbon tax, the uh, carbon tax revenue, uh, to reduce other more distortionary taxes. That is the second dividend. Um, <clears throat> and for a while, people thought this was the end of the story, uh, but it's actually a third effect, uh, and that is a tax interaction effect. Um, because the carbon tax also raises prices. Energy becomes more expensive. And that implies that your real take-home pay goes down. You are paid less for your labor because you can buy less uh, with it. And of course, it's not just the price of energy that goes up, but also the price of everything that uses energy. It's everything that goes up, right? Because shops will also pay higher energy bills and put that through to you. And if you don't go to the shop but buy everything from Amazon, then also their uh, diesel will go up and they will also need to charge you more for deliveries, right? And even though Amazon does not explicitly uh, charge you for delivery, they do charge you for delivering stuff, right? Uh, it's just hidden uh, from you. Um, <clears throat> So this tax interaction effect then again is a, is a, is a negative effect, right? Uh, because you reduce real pay, you also reduce the real incentive uh, to work, uh, and you reduce the returns on capital, so there's less, um, uh, less investment uh, and a lower labor supply. And this at least partly undoes, that uh, proper English, uh, the um, Uh, the uh, double dividend uh, that I spoke about earlier. There's also economists who claim that this tax interaction effect always overwhelms everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a bit uh, dubious, as you can see in uh, these slides. So there's a whole bunch of things going on, right? Um, so let's look at some uh, model results. What you're looking at at uh, the horizontal axis is emission reductions in the near term. And what you're looking at on the uh, vertical axis are welfare uh, variations. Then there's three colors, three different measurements of welfare, Hitchin equivalent variation, uh, consumption, and uh, GDP. Um, <coughs> and then the different crosses are different uh, parts, uh, different member states of the EU. Uh, positive is good, negative is bad. Uh, and what you see is that this uh, particular um, reform where uh, carbon tax is imposed and uh, payroll taxes are reduced, you see that this is mostly uh, positive effects, right? Not there's a few exceptions, but it's mostly uh, above uh, zero. Um, <clears throat> similar story, um, this is for a whole bunch of countries. Uh, now we have different labor markets where in dark blue, well, it's better to look here, um, we have sort of your micro 101 type of labor market, it's never, nobody ever believes. Uh, and then in the other blues, um, we have more complicated labor markets. You see it actually uh, increases uh, your, um, oh wait, this is um, changes in the uh, labor demand, labor supply. And again, it's positive. Actually, green jobs are being created, just like uh, our dear leaders uh, have promised uh, it would be. <clears throat> um, 
And then here, uh, again, different set of results. We're looking at different ways of using the carbon tax uh, revenue. Um, but that, I think, is better um, seen in this particular table. We have now moved from Europe to the United States. Uh, this is an older study. It's a forecast for the year 2010. Uh, what would happen if a $40 carbon tax would be uh, imposed, right? And this is a study that was done 20 years ago. Uh, but the insights still hold. So carbon tax is imposed. What are we going to do with the carbon tax revenue? Well, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Uh, first is send everybody a check in the post, which is strange to us Europeans, but this is what American governments sometimes do. They just send everybody a check in the post, or everybody who's legally in the country uh, a check in the post, right? Uh, this is so-called lump sum uh, redistribution of money. It's politically easy and administratively easy. Um, but of course, uh, in terms of distributional consequences, everybody gets the same check, right? Uh, it's perhaps not how you want to spend the money. Also, if you look at what actually happens uh, to the overall economy, it shrinks, right? This lump sum redistribution of money does not offset the costs of climate policy. Or not more than offsets the cost of climate policy. Uh, you can increase government spending. Again, it's not good for the economy. You can reduce uh, income taxes. That's these three rows. And this result is actually different, with the exception of this model here, um, from what you see in Europe. But if we then uh, increase the investment credit, so essentially reducing uh, not household taxes, but corporate taxes, corporate income, you actually see that the economy uh, has a positive effect. And we actually, indeed, in the US, reduced emissions while increasing GDP, right? <clears throat> you also see that, uh, okay, here we have corporation uh, taxes as well, uh, that different models come up with different results. So what did we learn from this? So first thing, well, this reform is actually pretty good in Europe, but it's not so good in the United States. And the reason goes back to the dead weight losses that I talked about in Europe. Weight taxes are high, but profit taxes are low. In the US, it's the other way around. In the US, personal income taxes are actually pretty low, but corporate income taxes are much higher. So increasing those or decreasing those is actually where you see the payoff, right? Uh, and this was 20 years ago. Uh, the US really had a deficit in investment, right? <laughs> That's why this comes out uh, so uh, very high. Um, so it's not just that, oh, we're going to do green tax reform, or ecological tax reform, as it's called. We're going to shift the burden from something to our emissions, and everything is going to be fine. No. You actually need to understand how does my economy work, what are the actual fiscal distortions that we have imposed on the economy. It's no hard and fast rule. You actually need to understand your economy. Um, and then also you have this result here that <coughs> Stanford says it's a uh, bad idea and Harvard says it's a good idea, right? And which expert do you believe? Jorgensen or Goulder? So in order to do this, what you need is politicians, right? Because politicians do tax reform. Politicians who understand how the economy works, know which of the experts is right, need to understand how their fiscal situation compares to the fiscal situation in other countries. Politicians, one, one popular pastime 
of politician is to just copy successful policy from other countries and just import it wholesale without further adjustment. No, that doesn't work uh, in this case. So you need politicians who understand economics, a fair amount of detail. Um, and, of course, you need politicians who can resist the temptation to just say, ah, we have more tax revenue. Let's do something popular, like uh, spend it on my constituency or send a post in the check to the people who voted for me, right? So theoretically, yes, there can be a double dividend. Practically, I'm not convinced that we have politicians who are smart and disciplined enough. And it's not just that you need a politician, but you actually need to get this through parliament, right? So you actually need the majority of politicians who can get behind this. In theory, yes. In practice, well, I'm not convinced, right? Um, we're going to break for 10 minutes, and then we're going to talk more about taxes and other policy instruments. Okay, let's continue. Um, we are slightly more than an hour ahead of schedule. Uh, I'm going to talk today and next week uh, about policy instruments. I'm going to try and do in three hours what I normally do in eight. Uh, so chances are I'm not going to quite make it to the end, uh, but we'll see. Um, <coughs> the slides are sort of a mixture of uh, this class and a previous class, so uh, the guidance isn't quite uh, the way it should be, or the roadmap isn't quite as it should be. Recording. Um, so, I'm recording now. <laughs> no. Uh, no problem for you guys. Uh, I was wondering, how can I still have 50 minutes? Um, <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, for, for somebody to come up with a rule that sort of is sensible for all very different users uh, is uh, almost impossible, right? So direct regulation, very successful in the past, works very well if you have a few point sources of pollution, like a few companies or a few factories that dump a lot of chemicals into the river, and you can just say, we're going to clean up those. But for climate, we are talking about everybody using energy, right? So everybody needs to be regulated. And of course, if we're talking about uh, food production, then also we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of producers that need to be regulated, right? And it's very hard to conceive of a regulation that would make uh, sense. Um, <coughs> so, what uh, people have turned to instead are market-based uh, instruments. And I'm going to talk about three of them, taxes, subsidies, and tradable uh, permits. So we call them market-based or incentive-conform type uh, of instruments. And unsurprisingly, uh, economists are fond uh, of these things because we use the market to um, solve environmental problems. So. Uh, what is an environmental tax? Uh, essentially, you pay a charge or a levy or a penalty or a tax or a something. It all depends on the political climate uh, that you're in, how you are allowed to call this. There's also legal differences uh, between these things. Um, you pay, let's call it a tax, for every unit emitted, preferably. Uh, but sometimes you cannot tax our emissions. We have to tax production or uh, the input into the production process uh, instead. For instance, if you drive a car, then you put in petrol, and you spit out CO2, but we measure the petrol that goes in. We don't measure the CO2 that comes out. So it is much easier to put a tax on the consumption of fuel than on the emission of CO2, right? Uh, of course, there's also a lot of taxes on the thing in between the car, which is actually perfectly innocent as long as it stands parked uh, by the road, right? It doesn't emit any CO2. Some countries have put a, a CO2 tax, a carbon tax on the ownership of cars, but it doesn't make any sense, right? 
it's the use of the car that matters, not the uh, ownership. Um, so that is one thing uh, you can do. Um, another thing you can do is essentially the double opposite. You can give a subsidy for every unit not emitted or every unit not consumed or not produced, right? Now, the two have the same effect in the short run. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, marginal costs, marginal benefits. On the horizontal axis, we have quantity. At the uh, vertical axis, we have something like your gain at the margin, your utility uh, at the margin. Um, in uh, brown, at least. Um, and what you have here in the dark brown are your private gains from emissions. And it's climate class, so this is carbon dioxide. Uh, so this is essentially roughly proportional to your energy use. And if you use very little energy, actually you have a lot of gain from using a little bit more. Uh, but at one point you stop using uh, energy and therefore you stop emitting more CO2, right? At one point your house is warm enough, you don't want to spend more energy and more money in heating it further, right? You think that 17 degrees is okay, or maybe 19 degrees, or maybe 23 degrees, but very few of you would sort of bring the temperature in your room up to 35 degrees, right? Because not only is that a fairly unpleasant temperature, but also uh, it actually costs a lot of money to do so. So at one point you stop, and that point is Q prime. Right? That is where the marginal costs of heating your home more are larger than the marginal benefits of heating your home more. Right? That is this point. Now what does a carbon tax do? Essentially it raises the price of energy, so the marginal costs go up, the marginal benefits stay the same, so the net benefits fall and you push things to uh, Q double prime. Right? That is essentially how a carbon tax works. You make it more uh, expensive and therefore uh, you would use uh, less. Now this is an environmental tax. In principles, I believe, and in week seven, I think, uh, we're gonna talk about this tax here, Q star, uh, which is the Pigou tax where we set the tax exactly equal to the marginal social losses uh, of emissions, right? <clears throat> an environmental tax is not the same as a Pigou tax. A Pigou tax is an environmental tax, but an environmental tax is not a Pigou tax, right? Um, the uh, reasoning here is that if you reduce emissions, you pay less tax, right? Um, and if you increase emissions, you pay more tax. And therefore, you have an incentive to reduce your emissions. Now let's compare this to a subsidy. Right. Words changed on the graph, but the lines stayed where they were. And that is because it's a double negative. If you reduce your emissions, you get more subsidy. A subsidy is a negative tax, but instead of uh, paying tax, you get a subsidy, right? So it's a double negative. Uh, if you increase your emissions, you either pay more tax in one system, and in the other system, you forego a subsidy. Right? So tax is a negative uh, Subsidy or subsidy is a negative tax. And instead of getting things, you're foregoing things. So it's a double negative, the two minus signs cancel, and it is exactly the same, right? So taxes and uh, subsidies have the same effect on production and consumption in the short run, right? That is what I said. Um, 
I'm going to talk about uh, the uniformity uh, of taxes uh, and subsidies below and uh, the, insure, the insured cost effectiveness. Um, let's look at the long run. So I showed you uh, this graph here, right? This was the marginal gain, marginal private gain from your activity that emits uh, stuff. Let's call it hitting your home. Um, and the total uh, looks something as follows, right? Where, lo and behold, the maximum is reached of the total where the marginal goes to zero, right? Um, now introduce, okay. Now, uh, this dotted line here is not the marginal gains, but the average gains. Now, let's introduce a tax to this. What happens with a tax on with your average costs? Well, you're losing money, right? You're paying money to the government. So, your average gains fall. But if we are talking about uh, a subsidy, now you're getting money. So your average gains increase. So at the margin, a tax and a subsidy have the same effect, but on average, they have the opposite effect. <coughs> So what does this imply for your returns on investment? This was your original situation. Now, if you want to invest more in whatever caused these emissions, you're actually going to pay more tax, so your average return on capital has fallen, right? Whereas with the subsidy, the average return on capital has increased. So a tax deters investment in the polluting activity but a subsidy stimulates investment in the polluting activity. So in the long run, a tax shrinks the polluting sector, but in the long run, a subsidy grows the polluting sector because you essentially make it more attractive to invest in this because you can harness more subsidies. Right? So in the short run, taxes and subsidies are equivalent in their effect on the environment, but in the long run, they have opposite effects, right? Um, now, taxes and subsidies obviously also have different budgetary implications, right? In one case, money flows from the government to the polluter. In the other case, money flows from the polluter to the government, right? So the distributional and budgetary implications are different too. So taxes and subsidies are not the same. Uh, for this reason that we sort of grow the offending sector in the long run with subsidies, economists really dislike subsidies, environmental subsidies. Politicians, of course, very much like uh, environmental subsidies because this is a way to be popular, right? You give away money, vote for me, I'll give you money. Right? Um, that's the way um, it is. Um, <clears throat> now, taxes and subsidies are two uh, instruments for um, environmental policy, for climate policy. Um, subsidies are more popular uh, than taxes. Uh, there are a few carbon taxes around, but not a great many. Um, there's many more carbon subsidies around. Uh, but the most popular form of environmental regulation for climate uh, are so-called tradable permits. And you no doubt uh, have heard of this. And tradable permits work as follows. Um, you start by the government setting an overall target, let's say, for emissions. And let's say we want to emit uh, 100 million tons of CO2 uh, this year, right? So we set an overall target. Then we cut those 100 million, the target for 100 million, we cut it into 100 million pieces and we create 100 million permits to emit one ton of carbon. And then 
somehow we get this to the people who emit carbon and say, well, if you want to emit CO2, then you have to have a permit to do so. Right, so far this is direct regulation. But then the market kicks in and if you think you have been given too many permits, you can sell your permits to somebody who thinks he or she has too few permits. Right? Uh, so that is in a nutshell how tradable permits uh, work. <coughs> Graphically, there's something as follows. Let's assume that we have two firms only, just to make the graph simple. Uh, firm one and firm two. Uh, we have emission reduction on this uh, axis. We have the marginal costs of emission reduction at uh, the vertical axis. And uh, emission reduction is more expensive in the margin in firm one than it is in firm two, right? It just has a steeper curve. Obviously, if they don't reduce emissions, they have no costs. Now, one way of allocating those permits, saying, well, we're going to cut the emissions by so much and we're going to give both firms the same effort. Their emission reduction, Q1 and Q2, are equal to each other. Now, if firm 2 has to cut emissions to Q2, then it's going to cost it P2. If firm 1 uh, has to cut its emissions to Q1, uh, then its costs are P1, right? So this is the initial situation, and then it's straight possible, right? Because uh, company two would not mind cutting emissions a little bit more, and it would sort of cost this, this, this uh, amount extra. And company one would really like this, right? If company two would do a little bit more and they would do a little bit less, they would save this amount of money. Company two would be happy to receive this amount of money for doing a little bit more, they would be equally well off. So a bargain can be struck between the two companies, right? Company one can convince company two to do more. In return, company one will do less, but give company two money. And they would be both better off, right? Um, <clears throat> and that is how tradable permits work. Uh, company one wants to do less, company two would accept to do more as long as it's financially compensated to do so and this process stops until uh, there's no more mutually advantageous uh, trade possible, right? And the result is that the price for company one and company two or the marginal emission reduction cost for company one and company two is equal. <coughs> Right? This is how it works with two companies. Of course, in actual tradable permit systems, there is many, many companies, right? But the principle is the same. Um, if the permit market works well, um, then all producers pay the same price. Uh, the margin, marginal costs uh, increase uniformly. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this point. Uh, essentially, I mean, what, what you do with a tax is that you make emissions more expensive. A tradable permits, if you're a buyer on the market, essentially, instead of paying a tax if you want to increase your emissions, you have to buy a permit to increase your emissions. Right? So that also increases the cost of the margin, and taxes and tradable permits are the same on the seller side. Uh, of on the buyer side of the market. On the seller side, essentially if you want to increase your emissions, you have fewer permits to sell and you forego revenue from your uh, uh, revenue from your permit sale. So in that sense, on the seller side of the permit market, company uh, two, is essentially like a, an environmental subsidy. Right? Taxes and subsidies are the same, so sellers and buyers on the permit market are treated in the same way at the margin. Right? <clears throat> Taxes and tradable permits are equivalent uh, in this sense and equivalent to uh, the subsidy as well. Now, one 
thing I skipped over was, well, we create these 100 million permits and then we get them to the polluter somehow. How would you do that? Uh, and that's actually uh, 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 an interesting question as well. The most popular way of doing this is so-called grandparenting. <clears throat> and essentially what grandparenting does is it gives the permits to current emitters. Or rather, it gives the permits for free based on proportional to emissions of the recent past. And that is why it's called uh, grandparenting, because it used to be called grandfathering, that what we have is the government giving away presents, right, free permits, by looking at the past. And uh, people initially thought this is what grandfathers do, right? And then they realized that grandmothers are just uh, as bad, if not worse, uh, at this. And therefore, uh, it's now called grandparenting. Right? The um, main political advantage of this is that it's easy. Because you confirm the status quo, right? It used to be that emissions were free. Now you have to have a permit to emit, but you got the permits for free, right? So it doesn't really change things. It confirms uh, the status quo, and therefore there's very few uh, people that would be upset uh, with you. Uh, the big uh, negative of grandparenting is that you start the market by giving away things for free, so nobody knows what the price is. Uh, another um, disadvantage is that you reward bad behavior in the past. So say if emission permits in 2022 are allocated based on emissions in 2020, then companies that for reasons that had nothing to do with climate policy, but because they wanted to impress their clients or their investors, or maybe they were just good people, uh, cut their emissions in 2020, they will get a very stingy uh, amount of permits. Whereas companies that were clever in retrospect and used a lot of energy two years ago, they will get a lot of permits, right? So you reward bad behavior in the past, right? That's another uh, disadvantage of grandparenting. <clears throat> um, an alternative to grandparenting is to auction the permits. And that is to sell these permits to the highest bidder. Uh, the um, main advantage from the perspective of the authorities is that it generates a lot of revenue. And in that sense, it is very much like a carbon tax. In fact, it's almost the same as a carbon tax now, right? You impose a price on emissions, and a lot of money flows to the government, right? Um, the big difference between auctions, permits, and a carbon tax is that a carbon tax is stable, whereas a permit price fluctuates, right? So that is then the only difference uh, that is left. So this revenue is good from the perspective of the treasury. It's of course bad from the perspective of the companies that have to buy these permits in an auction. Um, you start with a price, right? The market begins with a price. Everybody knows uh, the price of uh, the permits. Um, What you see uh, at the moment uh, is that people sort of propose mixed schemes that m initially most permits are grandparented, but some are auctioned. Um, what you also see is actually a gradual shift away from grandparenting to auctioning as the market matures. Uh, more and more permits uh, are auctioned rather than uh, grandparented. These are the two basic schemes operating in uh, practice. In uh, academic journals, uh, you also find uh, this proposal. So what do these 
tradable permits really do, right? They create a permit to dump stuff into the atmosphere, right? You essentially get a license to emit. Um, and then the government collects the revenue if auctioned, or you give that right to companies. But essentially what you're doing is you take the atmosphere or an aspect of the atmosphere and either the government expropriates it or the government expropriates it and gives it to companies. That's very strange. If you look at uh, the UN Charter, the atmosphere is the common property of humankind. It's not for the government to take this and give it to a company, right? It's our air that we breathe, right? It's our climate. Um, and you could say, well, actually, the fair thing to do would be to say, well, we should not give the permits to the cause of the problem, but we should give the permits to the victims of the problem. And if you want to emit, then come and buy uh, these permits off me, right? And then I'm automatically compensated for the damage you're going to do to my climate. So theoretically, this has appeal, right? Practically, non-starter for two reasons. Uh, one, it is actually very diff. You, you, you would want to give out permits in proportion to the damage that is done to people. Right? And that's very hard to quantify, and we'll talk at length uh, about that in a few weeks. Um, <clears throat> The other, and that's a political point, if we do this globally, and it's again something we'll talk about in a few weeks, the main victims of climate change are people in faraway countries who are desperately poor. Now, you may think, well, it's a good idea if we would have to buy permits from the Bangladeshis before we can emit CO2. You may say, well, this is a fair thing to argue. But giving billions of pounds to Bangladesh may not be politically feasible, right? Um, so, in theory, yes. In practice, no. Um, what almost made it is a fourth way of doing it. Almost made it through um, the House uh, in California is to say, well, <coughs> the atmosphere is the proper common property of humankind. So let's just give everybody the same uh, permits, the same amount of permits, and distribute these to households. If companies want to emit CO2, they have to buy the permits from the households. Uh, so this is a lump sum transfer, uh, again, to households. Um, as I said, it almost worked in California. <laughs> then they got cold feet and tried auctioning. How boring. Um, you could see this as fair, you could also see it as not fair. If you do this in Europe, for instance, then what you would see is that people uh, in Norway, because distances are large and winters are cold, emit much more, use much more energy, emit much more CO2 than people in Spain, right, where distances are shorter and the climate is uh, not as cold. Um, and essentially you would be saying, well, we kind of give the same amount of permits to the people in Spain and the people in Norway, and that we call that fair. But of course, you're punishing the Norwegians for decisions that their parents and grandparents made, right? For living in Norway. So it sounds fair, but it's not necessarily fair. Discussed, uh, but has never been implemented in practice. <clears throat> now, this initial allocation matters, but it doesn't matter for the market. And that is the Coase theorem. <clears throat> Do you know the Coase theorem? Yes and no. <laughs> so let me spend uh, a few minutes uh, on that. So the, I won't take you through the entire Coase theorem uh, because I have 10 minutes only. Um, so let's consider a cost-benefit uh, diagram. We have a quantity of something, uh, emissions, and we have the price of something on the vertical axis. We have the marginal benefits uh, of emission reduction, 
and we have the marginal costs uh, of emission reduction. And this again is the point where you stop uh, doing it. Now, um, <clears throat> cost benefit will tell you that the optimal, the social optimal is where the marginal costs equal the marginal benefits. So we would want to find a point where emissions are Q star and then at that point the marginal cost and marginal uh, benefits are equal to P star, right? So this is the point that we want to achieve. This is where the social uh, optimum uh, lies. Now I'm going to step away from climate and I'm going to talk about noise. Um, so one way of seeing this as this is Suppose you live in an apartment and next door lives somebody who is very bad at playing saxophone, but really likes playing saxophone and does it a lot, right? Uh, so this uh, is the sort of the time of saxophone playing that your neighbor would choose. And then as he is forced to play less and less and less and less, uh, the marginal costs is sort of foregone benefits of playing the saxophone. Um, go up and up and up and up, right? And the green curve then is your annoyance with uh, your neighbor, right? If he doesn't play, you're not annoyed, uh, but the more he plays, the worse it gets, right? So uh, that is how to read uh, this graph. <clears throat> now let's assume that you live in a building um, where there is a right to silence, right? So if somebody wants to make noise or if somebody wants to make noise after 10 in the evening, you can just say, shut up, right? So you can just say, well, I don't care about your saxophone playing. I'm just gonna forbid you to play. But at that point, actually, I mean, your neighbor really, really wants to play. So what he could do is knock on your door and say, I'm going to give you five pounds if you allow me to play for half an hour. Uh, you think half an hour is not that bad, right? I'm not that annoyed by half an hour of saxophone playing between 10 at night and 10.30 at night, right? Because I wasn't doing much anyway. And you can strike a mutually advantageous deal, right? But if we talk about not half an hour uh, of saxophone playing, but three hours of saxophone playing, right, at that point you are incredibly annoyed, right? Because by now it's one o'clock in the evening and you really want to go to bed. Uh, also, so you would demand a large compensation. But yeah, he is getting tired, his lips are getting sore. Uh, so. Um, he is not that bothered anymore by having played one and a half hours, three hours already. Do I really want to play 15 more minutes? Nah, I've done enough. So, yeah, if there were no cost, I would do it a little bit longer. But now there is a cost. I'm willing to give you one pound uh, to play 15 minutes more. But you say, no, 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 I would need 30 pounds uh, to endure this, right? Because, as I said, he's a bad saxophone player. A noisy one, uh, but not a good one. <clears throat> and if the starting point is a right to silence, then you guys can strike a mutually advantageous deal until this point, right? At this point, the compensation that you would need to endure more noise is higher than the compensation that your neighbor is willing to pay you, right? So your bargaining takes you here but stops goes no further, it stops at this particular point. Now imagine that you live in a building with different rules, where there's no right to silence, or the landlord does not enforce the right to silence, right? Well, <clears throat> at this point the guy is playing for three and a half hours, right? And it's 1.30 in the morning, so you could knock on his door and you say, can you please shut up? I'm willing to give you 30 pounds to shut up. Right? No, I'm willing to give you 30 pounds to shut up. And his lips are getting sore, so he thinks, yeah, I'll take the 30 pounds. Right? 
Um, that bargaining continues and continues and continues, but at this point, your, we're not that bothered, your willingness to pay for him to shut up, maybe only five pounds, but he is really keen and he wants to get at least 10 pounds to shut up, right? So at this point, you cannot strike a bargain. So if the starting point is silence, no, uh, if the starting point is silence, if the starting point is you can make as much noise as you want, you're going to negotiate and negotiate and bargain and bargain and bargain, and that stops at this point. <clears throat> so that is the Coase theorem, that regardless of the initial allocation of property rights, in this case the right to make noise versus the right to silence, is irrelevant for where the bargaining process ends up. It always ends up in the social optimum, <clears throat> right? That is uh, Coase. This is Ronald Coase. Um, was Ronald Coase. Um, that regardless of the initial allocation of property rights, the market will find the same allocation uh, in the end. So it doesn't matter for the price of emission permits, whether you auction permits, whether you grandparent permits, whether you give them to the victims, or whether you give them out uh, on an equal per capita basis, you always end up in the same, uh, with the same price and the same final allocation. Of course, the initial allocation uh, does matter for the distribution of costs. Right? If you have the right to silence in your building, it is you who is getting money. If you have the right to make as much noise as you want in your building, it's the saxophone player who gets the money. Right? So the initial allocation of permits matters for who pays what, for the distribution of cost, but it doesn't matter for the final result, who does what, right? So one way uh, of interpreting the Coase theorem uh, is uh, that it separates questions of efficiency of the final market allocation from questions of equity, of who bears the costs of environmental regulation, right? Um, now, <coughs> Coase rightly won the Nobel Prize for this. Not just for this, but for uh, another part of the Coase theorem as well. Right? Um, <clears throat> this is a good place to stop because I have two minutes left and there's no way I can do the next chapter in two minutes. Okay, I see you guys next week. <laughs>